but is stronger than bone. And anything stronger on earth than enamel is only diamond. So friends, we have got bones stronger than only, uh, is, uh, less stronger than only two things, enamel and diamond. And we are going to talk about its weaknesses, which is osteoporosis. Now, now is the time that we, we are going to talk about musings in assessment and DEXA and Murali Podwal from Bombay, a member of the editorial team. And he has so many assignments over his shoulders. He will. He has found out time today to talk about this assessment and role of DEXA. I stop share, and yes, sir. Murli, it is your time now. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. As the title says, uh, I am going to talk about some music in assessment and DEXA. Predominantly, we'll be talking about DEXA only. Uh, one second, please. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So we'll t I'll talk at uh, the title with Sir gave me his musings in assessment and DEXA. So I'll be meandering back and forth over the different topics. We'll try to cover the, uh, the important aspects of DEXA. And Srinivas will continue in defining the approach without DEXA. So it is said that normality is a paved road. It's comfortable to walk, but there are no flowers grow on it. So it's not normalcy that we are dealing with here. We're dealing with a normal bone. And the strength of bone and the factors affecting it are many. It's a multifactorial condition that we are dealing with. We are dealing with bone strength, which, which starts taking its form from childhood, reaches its peak in middle age, and then declines progressively to old age. So it is a very dynamic process that we are trying to assess and try to prevent and try to treat and to prevent morbidity form. Recording in progress. So the outline of my presentation will be something like this. We'll talk something about the principles at the background, the indication, the limitation, importance, alternatives. I will leave it to Srinivas to discuss. Now, what we know as DEXA or dual energy absorption metry is that a fourth first approved by FDA in 1998 and it's a niche investigation for assessing osteoporosis and monitoring treatment. It replaced the other methods that we are familiar with including quantitative USG, CT and MRI over a period of time to become the gold standard now. What are the advantages of DEXA? Specifically, it is a much easier investigation as compared to CT and MRI. It is great. It involves using something like an X-ray machine, not more than that. It has shorter scan times, lower cost, lower radiation. And plus, we have some clinical experience and guidelines which we shall discuss shortly. It was almost in parallel with effective medication that DEXA was developed. So therefore, the use of DEXA in monitoring also was almost in parallel that new medications came in. As new therapies came in, DEXA also kept pace with that and became better. So what it effectively does is it generates a 2D image of complex 3D structure and generates a report of bone mineral density, which is a question of the quotient of the bone mineral content divided by area of the region of interest, which has been scanned, typically the lumbar spine of the hip. So there is a CRM with an X-ray soap below the patient and two distinct energy photons specific for soft tissue and bone are affected. There is a collimator between the patient and the source which, to reduce the scatter. And these attenuations from low and high energy beams detected above the patient are combined to create a planar image to assess bone mineral density or bone mass per unit volume. That's what we want to know. So we want to know bone mineral content and the area scanned and we get the ratio of these two to get the bone mineral density, which is then expressed as the T-score, which is the number of standard deviations between the patients, mean BMD, and a normative population. And it is also expressed as a Z-score, which is the number of standard deviation above or below the mean score for an age and gender match population. 
if you look at it, one and two standard deviations from the mean of a T score encompasses almost 68 and 95 percent of the population, respectively. Now, since peak bone mass is achieved at 30 to 40, 40 years on an average, in younger adults and children, one cannot use the T score. One prefers the Z score, which is an age and gender match score. To control for racial and ethnic differences, the DEXA has been calibrated. It calculates T score based on normative databases. These are all based on the NHANES3 database that includes non Hispanic, white, Hispanic, black, and Asian individuals. In addition to this, there is also a pediatric normative database which is also a very big. And which sites to be normally scanned? You scan the hip, the lumbar spine, typically L1 to L4, the distal third of the radius. And sometimes whole body takes a scan, but what is most important in the first two, the whole hip and the lumbar spine, L1 to L4. On central DXC, that is the, the vertebral body, that is L1 to L4, it is that bone mineral density results can be interpreted using the WHO T score. There is a proven ability to predict fracture risk, which is not exactly without bias. We will come to that. This is the basis of the new WHO algorithm for predicting fracture risk. It's proven for effective targeting of fracture treatments. Fairly good precision. It's definitely effective at monitoring response to treatment in patients with prior fragility fractures. The use of DEXA is primarily to monitor this. It has an acceptable accuracy. It's about more than two and a half, three decades of use. Stable calibration, effective instrument quality control procedures, shorter scan times, rapid setup, low radiation dose. And there are reference ranges also which are available. But what, what about correction for height and weight? Some attempts have been made to correct the DEXA reading for height and weight, especially the reporting part of it. And some DEXA manufacturers allow correction in calculation of Z-score to account for decrease in fracture risk with increase in weight. Especially in children, correction of value for height may be important. But these are not yet part of the mainstream. The WHO definition of osteoporosis is based on DEXA scores. Anything that is less than or equal to minus 2.5 standard deviation below the reference mean of the population is considered osteoporosis. So, plus, if the presence of one fragility fracture, it becomes established osteoporosis. Although osteoporosis is diagnosed on BMD less than or equal to minus 2.5 standard deviation below the mean of that population, many individuals who sustain fragility fractures are above this cutoff level of this, which is something which is difficult to explain. Especially the size of the bone is one factor which is often underestimated. <clears throat> so larger bones are likely to convey superior strength, despite the fact of having the same BMD as a smaller bone. Now, these are factors for which we do not have too much solution right now. For example, if you take a look at the types of femoral necks in women who are postmenopausal, those women who have narrower or smaller femoral necks, they tend to remodel during menopause by laying down endosteal and periosteal bone. And therefore, there is an increase in particle thickness. Whereas those who have a wider femoral neck, they tend to remodel by endosteal absorption of bone, thus leading to an increase in the area and a decrease in the bone mineral concentration. And in either case, the BMD remains the same. It has fallen in both the cases. However, the one with a narrower femoral neck is potentially one with maintained strength or better strength. This could be some one of the reasons, this is one of the theories that has been proposed amongst numerous others. Now, what is the rationale of the T-score? The T-score is believed that the proportion of women with T-score less than or equal to minus 2.5 standard deviations of the population mean is equal to the lifetime risk of fragility fracture of 30%. Now, it is expected that the women or individuals below this arbitrary cutoff would have greater fracture risk across the board. But it's not that way. And further, this cutoff should be redefined with new data and experience. So you would expect that over two, two and a half decades that we've been following this criteria of the T-score to define osteoporosis, we would have seen some refinement 
of the criteria and some refinement of the scores over time with data and experience but the value of the t score remains pretty arbitrarily the same after 25 years despite evidence to the fact that t scores of minus 2.5 standard deviations or less captures only 50% of the women with fragility fracture and there is far lesser consensus on osteoporosis in men and despite that the same arbitrary cutoff is applicable in men above 50 years some of the fallacies that are associated with the discussed one it is also understood that fracture risk in men is lower due to larger skeletal structure in age match groups which you cannot explain with dengue score and fracture rates in men are less than half that in women greater than 55 years of age but the corresponding morbidity because of hip fractures because of osteoporosis is much higher in men as compared to that of women of the comparable age so there are some contradictions some fallacies which are yet to be resolved so coming to the indications of dexa i like to group them not from the literature my own understanding that they should be diagnostic to arrive at a diagnosis or screening of vulnerable population therapeutic in which you do dexa as a baseline study before instituting anti osteoporotic medication in patients with or without fragility fracture monitoring and preventive is more towards population health initiatives and of course act defining risk of a given population and the risk level for a given population for intervention for public health policy some of the indications include women 65 years and older men 70 years and older women less than 65 years with estrogen deficiency history of maternal hip fracture below 50 low body mass history of amenorrhea more than one year before the age of 42 and so on and so forth but this list is long i have not included the entire list i don't intend to be exhaustive here to this elite planet but these are just some of the indications which are given for texa relative contraindications are many but there are no absolute contraindications most of which are related to extreme high or low body mass index inability to remain in the correct position or uh, remain motionless for the machine and any condition that may interfere with the measurement sometimes implant hardware devices or other foreign material but then there are some extended applications of dexa which are being currently talked about especially with respect to aseptic lubing of joint implants so, so these are also fallacy concluding dexa is the gold standard for diagnosis of osteoporosis when available and recommended by all clinical practice guidelines this is from our recent paper which we submitted to the yearbook two sites are recommended lumbar spine and the whole hip the who classification based on the t score is accepted by all clinical practice guidelines however the frax is country specific and may be interpreted with or without dexa depending on the region the dexa may also be used to determine trabecular bone score which is still in its stage of evolution it may also be used to determine muscle mass and provide some criteria for sarcopenia so these are the refer- key references that i used and i thank you for your attention thank you dr murli uh, will you please stop share we have stop sir all right so now the point to ponder as far as framing of guidelines are concerned that you have yourself said that it it could be uh 50 70 years you said for males and 65 for females could you please repeat again yeah something like that only. all right so what i wanted to say that all of us have to huddle together and feel that will indian in indian context we will keep it as 50 years common for males and females i would like to know reaction from the house professor ramesh are you there okay so 
Professor Ramesh is not there. Any other no, comments no. are there? Yes, Professor Ramesh. Sir, please. Yes. As for the guidelines are concerned, definitely uh, there is a little variability in the literature when we look at the different perspective. But uh, as said, in our circumstances, in our, I think, whatever the suggestions have been made are quite okay for the DEXA and for its applications. I, I mean, it's quite, quite okay. Right. So you don't think uh, the age has to be reduced for submitting a patient for DEXA scan for diagnostic oh. purpose at age 50? Even no. for females? No, in the females, it has to be around 50 and 55. Uh -huh. I think because our patients are definitely on that edge. Uh -huh. So, uh, because... We're talking of physiological age, sir. We're talking of physiological age. There yes. is a very a very high incidence of early menopause in our uh, yes. Yes, country. Exactly. So, exactly. Yes. Exactly. so we would should start early. Right. And we have a great proportion of hysterectomized patients yes. as well. Yes. Right. So one point in while framing the guidelines would be what is for females and what is for males. For females, we agree that it should be 50 years. Yes. And for males, it would be Professor uh -huh. same or 60? 60, 60 would be better. 60 yeah, would be better. much better. Right. We have been talking about a standard reduction and whenever there is a uh, each uh, e each score difference, then that one score deviation says that it the fracture risk in gets increased by one point five to three times, roughly around twice. You have already said that it is in the osteo osteopenia range that fifty percent of the fractures do take place, and rest fifty percent when it is a real osteoporotic age. We have talked, you have talked about all the various grades, but presence of a fragility fracture in osteoporosis range of minus 2.5 standard deviation is what it makes severe osteoporosis. Now, assessment of bone quality, you have rightly said, is in preliminary stage and uh, it is it can be used only for research purposes. So now is the time for Dr. Srinivas to speak on primary evaluation without DEXA. Dr. Srinivas. Thank you, sir. I'll, I will uh, stop sharing. Spare my screen. Right. This is your screen. Can you see the uh, yes, presentation? Yes, 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 yes. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Ja and uh, Dr. Amarnath and the IOA for this opportunity today. Uh, my talk is on primary evaluation for osteoporosis uh, without using DEXA. So a primary assessment is the initial examination of a patient by a medical professional. And this should include history, examination, lab tests, imaging, radiographs, um, and others. So evaluation without DEXA may be discussed under these broad uh, headings. History includes uh, fracture risk assessment and clinical assessment, which would also include examination, laboratory tests, radiological imaging, vertebral fracture assessment, body composition analysis, physical performance tests, nutritional assessment, and medication history. Specifically given to look for certain medications. Assessment is done to identify those at risk of developing osteoporosis, those at risk of fractures, and to identify appropriate thresholds when intervention may be undertaken to prevent further damage and treat damage that has occurred. There are two strategies for uh, fracture risk assessment, and these are screening and case finding. In countries where resources are available, Routine screening using DEXA and FRAX has been advised for women over the age of uh, uh, 50. Now, in India, it, it, it could be less, as uh, Dr. Jha had suggested, uh, to diagnose osteoporosis and stratify the risk uh, in resource-challenged countries in, that is in low economic status or uh, high population numbers. Routine screening using DEXA cannot be performed. 
So a case finding strategy involves identifying cases based on their risk factors or using questionnaires and selectively using expensive diagnostic methods in those who are likely to have osteoporosis to establish the diagnosis. It also includes identifying cases once the fragility fractures have occurred. So there are a multitude of screening tools available to assess osteoporosis and its risk for fracture. Of these, the common ones are listed here. And of these, uh, FRAX, OSTA, SCORE, and MOS uh, have been validated for Indian population. So the FRAX tool is fracture risk assessment tool developed in uh, Sheffield, may be used with uh, or without DEXA. Uh, and the parameters recorded are age, sex, height, weight, history of uh, previous fractures, history of uh, uh, fracture hip in a parent, long-term glucocorticoid therapy, low body mass index, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, secondary osteoporosis, uh, cigarette smoking, alcohol, um, and with or without uh, femoral neck bo bone mineral density. Current guidelines recommend screening of postmenopausal women uh, over the age of uh, 65 years of age and younger postmenopausal women with risk factors for osteoporosis with a DEXA. Uh, with FRAX, treatment is recommended if the, if the 10 year risk of uh, uh, more, risk is more than 20% for major osteoporotic fracture or more than 3% for uh, hip fractures in patients with osteopenia. In most women with normal bone mineral density or mild osteopenia, it takes at least 15 years for osteoporosis to develop. There are other risk factors that are not included in FRAX that may influence the occurrence of fragility fractures. And these are listed here, and they include falls and frailty, sarcopenia, loss of uh, height more than four centimeters, thoracic kyphosis, systemic diseases like inflammatory, endocrine, hematological, neurological, uh, nutritional, lung disorders, bariatric surgery, and medications. So FRAX without DEXA designation of high risk of fracture is usually associated with the densitometric diagnosis of osteoporosis in about 85% uh, of the cases, according to one study. Uh, conversely, there are less than 1% patients who were at high risk of major osteoporotic or hip fractures when their T-scores and FRAX without BMD were compared. FRAX without BMD produced predictions that were identical to those of FRAX with BMD in most cases. Younger age is more indicative of an identical prediction. DEXA provides objective evidence of weak bone that can sustain a fracture. The accuracy of predictions increases with objective evidence of DEXA. Uh, but there are limitations to, uh, to FRAX. It does not take into account the quantitative effect of the, of the factors recorded. Uh, examples include the number of previous, previous fractures and the exact dosage of glucocorticoid intake. FRAX models must be ca calibrated for nations with uh, fracture and mortality epidemiology. Singapore uses the OSTA or osteoporosis self-assessment tool for Asians uh, for detecting a postmenopausal woman's osteoporosis risk. The OSTA score is calculated by age in years minus weight in kilograms. Patients are placed into three risk groups based on this score, uh, high risk, medium risk, and low risk. High risk patients are recommended to have a DEXA. In medium risk group, DEXA is considered only if they have other risk factors. In low, low risk group, no further action is required. Garvan Fracture Index Calculator uh, developed in Australia is used in New Zealand and Spain for screening for osteoporosis. Q Fracture is used in the UK. It includes multiple risk factors for calculating the risk. It gives the cumulative risk of fracture, um, but intervention thresholds are based on FRAX and not on Q Fracture. The SCORE tool is validated for use in India. It also includes uh, risk factors. Uh, the MORS is actually for the males. Uh, clinical assessment is done to identify risk factors. We have seen them before. Most of the clinical practice guidelines agree on the core risk factors of osteoporosis, sustaining fragility fractures. Risk factors have been classified into modifiable and non-modifiable. Major risk factors are those incorporated in the calculation of the FRAX score. If these factors can be modified, the risk of developing a fracture may be altered. So this strategy is the cornerstone of the preventive management of osteoporosis. Lab tests include routine tests like uh, full blood count, ESR, CRP, and other tests to detect secondary causes listed here. 
Uh, markers of bone formation, uh, P1NP and bone resorption, CTX, are two important serum markers to track rate of formation and resorption. When used alone, they are not reliable as there may be wide variation uh, between times of the day and between labs. So CPGs have not given much importance to using them for diagnosis or risk stratification. Their main use is to assess response to treatment and to diagnose secondary osteoporosis. Imaging of osteoporosis uh, includes radiographs, ultrasound, CT, MRI, and EOS, apart from the DEXA that uh, Dr. Murli has uh, talked about. I will go through imaging um, other than DEXA just for completion's sake. Radiographic imaging, SINGS index originated from India, but alone it has poor predictive value for osteoporosis. In combination with OSTA, it may be used for screening. Uh, we need more Indian studies on its use in com combination with other tools uh, for screening. In vertebral fracture assessment, vertebral heights are compared with each other and the expected heights uh, using a radiograph or even a DEXA. The only validated site for quantitative ultrasound is the heel. Negative heel ultrasound without any clinical risk factors may be used to rule out osteoporosis, but it cannot be used to diagnose or monitor treatment. Uh, there are limitations in terms of accuracy, especially for larger individuals or individuals with certain medical conditions. Quantitative CT is considered gold standard after DEXA for bone density assessment. Opportunistic CT is used to diagnose when CT scan is performed for other reasons. Dual energy CT shows bone material differentiation. HRCT provides detailed information about the bone microarchitecture. Uh, Hounsfield unit of less than 110 in CT significantly correlates with osteoporosis. MRI scan is less used than quantitative CT and it can measure cortical bone porosity, osteoid density, morphologic uh, structure and mineralization. EOS is new technique where AP and lateral uh, views are simultaneously done. It has low radiation dose. And recent advances future imaging could include multimodal techniques and machine learning techniques. Analysis of body composition may be done to assess not only bone mass, but also muscle mass uh, and strength and fat mass. Uh, there are important, uh, uh, th these are important tissues being recognized in aging and fragility fractures. Common tools used to measure are the BMI, uh, DEXA and fat referenced MRI scans. BMI generally correlates with fat accumulation, but it is insensitive to distribution of fat. And sarcopenia and frailty uh, are important conditions associated with osteoporosis. These are diagnosed with clinical tests, uh, like grip strength using a JAMA uh, dynamometer, short physical performance battery to test gait speed and chest strength. The timed up and go test is done to assess mobility, balance, and walking ability and false risk in, uh, in older adults. That's a video from uh, YouTube, actually, that shows the uh, tuck test. Uh, so this is timed. Uh, less than 12, cent, uh, 12 seconds is normal. Assessment of nutrition includes weight, weight loss, BMI, and limb circumference. And medication history is given separately here to give the classes of medicines to uh, take care. Uh, with Im immunosuppressants, thyroid hormones, gonadal hormones, diabetic drugs, and anti-epileptics. And these are the important classes. To summarize, major part of assessment of osteoporosis, fracture risk, sarcopenia, and frailty is by history and examination. Screening tools should be validated for the population under interest. Evaluate uh, bone mass, muscle mass, and strength, and fat mass. Assessment of nutrition, activity, medications, Sarcopenia and frailty should be done to plan for proper management. Quantitative ultrasound may be used to require DEXA. Body composition analysis may be used to assess potential impact on bone health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas. You have, uh, please stop share. Yes. So uh, you have rightly dealt with various modalities which can be employed in our Indian context. And I think the Singapore OSTA criteria in which you only require age and body weight. Is that right? Yes, sir. So, that's for postmenopausal women. For males, I think MORS is more uh, suitable. Right. 
So this is one, that is another. Maybe we can pick up two or three modalities and then think of which we can advocate where facilities for DEXA are not available. Perhaps combining uh, uh, OSTA with uh, SINGS index, maybe. Yes, more. yes. Dr. Jawahar, you wanted to say something. Uh, uh, since we are giving guidelines. Your voice is little. No, can you, can you hear me? Uh, I, we can hear you. Okay. Since the, we are talking about the guidelines, there are two points which are very much uh, popular in orthopedic practice. One is this heel ultrasound which he has already talked about. So the voice is low? Yes. It's low. Not audible. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's very low. Uh, okay, so he has been talking about that one we should keep is uh, ultrasound, heel ultrasound. Please. The so second very important point is that ultrasound, so many camps are going on. How much they should continue? That is the guideline we are giving. That is one. And second is when the radiologist has written down in his report that this patient is having osteopenia or osteoporosis on an X-ray of the spine. Should we consider it as a diagnosis or no? Because this is day-to-day -day practice problem. Right. Uh, talking about heel ultrasound itself, that those machines are also not available in a capital town like Patna. Whenever we want to do it, there is hardly one or two available here. They have to be brought from other cities. So availability and then cross reliability that you do it with ultrasound and do it with DEXA. But then it definitely gives... Yes. Sir, sir, what is the guideline we want to tell to the members, should we go for it or not? And there is a third modality, which is scanning the x-ray. There is a box where you scan the x-rays of. What about that? Because that is what is going on in the practice. All these pharmaceutical companies are conducting such uh, things. Okay. Do regarding x-ray, Dr. Srinivas, would you like to make a comment? So regarding X-rays, uh, you know, vertebral fracture assessment can be done uh, using X-rays, and uh, also if we are using SINGS index in combination with OSTA, uh, there, there is a, a some evidence that it is useful. Uh, used alone, SINGS index is not useful, sir. Right. So we will keep all these points when we are going to discuss uh, regarding framing of guidelines. Now, now is Dr. Renuka. He is from Bengaluru and presently today perhaps she is in Mumbai and she will be talking on biomarkers and monitoring. Thank you very much for coming to make your presentation. Thank you so much, sir. I'll just share this. I'm unable to share the screen. Uh, uh, so Dr. Jha has to... Uh... Yes. The same, sir. sir, you have right. to share. Yeah. Right. No, still not. Can you share now? So after you stop no, sir, sharing, you stop share, I'll sir. be able to. I have not stopped. Okay, fine. Now yes. you can, Renata. Yeah, thanks. Still so foremost, I would like to thank Dr. Jha and the IOT for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak on this uh, uh, topic on biomarkers in monitoring osteoporosis. Uh, you know, we know very well that bone is a dynamic organ, which is having constant remodeling, which is ha uh, happening uh, continuously to avoid fractures, microfractures. And it is consisting of collagen, the matrix proteins, as well as the cells of which the osteoblasts are the cells, which are mainly the bone forming cells, and the osteoclasts are mainly the bone resorption cells, which are giant cells present on the surface of the bone. And this constant remodeling which happens, happens under the uh, influence of the rank ligand, as well as the WNT pathway is the one which regulates this uh, formation and uh, resorption. The, uh, the bone formation markers are actually the ones which are released by the osteoblasts, the mineral proteins like uh, bone alkaline phosphatase, procollagen, and osteocalcin, uh, whereas the bone resorption markers are the 
uh, enzymes like as well as the collagen and uh, which has which gets cleaved at the periphery so uh, as well as the breakage products which lead to pyridoline uh, proslabs depyridoline enzymes like cathepsin and tartrate resistant and we know that these markers which are being produced in these cells are now can be measured biochemically and that's why they have been called as bone turnover markers which are definitely useful for monitoring individual osteoporotic patients though they are not very useful as of now for primary diagnosis of osteoporosis. So these bone uh, uh, markers, they have been classified, which can be measured both in the serum as well as in the urine. And the ones which are formed in the serum, you have the, the bone form. These are classified as bone formation markers, bone resorption markers, as well as the regulator markers. The regulator markers are not really much in use right now like the rank Leiden, osteoprogerin, uh, Dickoff, and sclerostin, whereas the bone formation and resorption markers are much available in the market. However, when we look at the resorption markers, which is present in the urine, it is a little cumbersome process. It needs to take into consideration the renal function, the correction with creatinine, and it takes 24 hour samples. So that being the thing, it's the serum markers are the markers which are actually being used. So it is the, and the, uh, of these so many markers which are there, there are uh, two markers which have been recommended by the IOF, IFCC, and laboratory medicine. So one of them is the collagen type 1 cross-linked telopeptides, that is the NTX1 and CTX1, which are also known as beta cross-labs, which are markers of osteoclast activity. And these are the resorption markers. So here you can have them in alpha and beta form, but what we actually measure is the beta form, which indicates that it is a measure of the degradation of the relatively old bone, which gets converted as the bone ages. NTX1 is uh, the marker can be measured both in serum and urine. However, as I said, it is not, uh, it causes a lot of uh, variations. There are a lot of biological variations, particularly with the consumption of food, as well as with its fasting. So CTX1 has been the one beta cross laps, which is uh, recommended as the bone resorption marker of choice by IOF, uh, as well as IFCC and lab medicine. The bone formation marker of choice is actually a, a, a procollagen and it has both an N-terminal and a C-terminal, but of that, the P1NP, the N-terminal one, is the one, the procollagen, which has been recommended as the marker of choice for bone formation. This is basically because P1NP has a very low inter-individual variability, less of circadian variations, relatively stable at room temperature, secreted in the plasma in time, and we can measure by automated instruments Usually we measure the total P1 NP, and uh, uh, it has uh, uh, it has also been noted, particularly in patients who have been given anabolic uh, hormones, that uh, it it shows significant increase in the majority of the postmenopausal women when we look at the formation markers. That is why these two markers, the beta CTX as well as the resorption marker and P1 NP as the a formation marker are markers of choice. However, there might be situations like a patient who has a renal failure, there are other markers like tartrate resistant acid phosphate is TRAP5 is a better marker to uh, use because it does not, it is not secreted in the urine and not uh, causes uh, variation. So when we are talking about uh, the changes or when you are monitoring a patient on osteoporosis treatment, then how do you know that this change is significant? Because the, the problem with the usage of all these markers is the wide variability which is seen in the biological variations which are there inherent to these markers as well as a lot of analytical with, uh, variations. However, the new markers are better, like beta CTX1 and P1NP can be automated. So when you say that the change should be significant enough when you're monitoring a patient large enough to be called as a change. So this change is usually for urinary markers is to the tune of 50%. And for serum markers such as CTX, P1NP, and bone-specific phosphatase, the change should be 30%. If at all we have not done a baseline value, then of course the median reference of the population or what we call as biological reference interval can be used. But still, 
to uh, measure a, a basal value and then look for the change is important. When you talk in term, terms of therapy, the first uh, line drugs which we usually, that are chosen in cases of osteoporosis is the bisphosphonate therapy, which is uh, maybe risidronate uh, or zoledronate or relindronate or evendronate. So, namely, so when uh, this marker, when these drugs are given, it causes, a, it acts by basically reducing the bone resorption through inhibition of the osteoclast, increases the bone mineral density, and as well as lowering the risk of the fractures, which we are aware of. What happens with the markers is the beta CTX1, which is a resorption marker, uh, indicative of an osteoclastic activity, it exhibits a rapid reduction around 50 to 80 percent with the maximum separation happening within approximately two months. Whereas uh, in separation, where the separation of the bone formation markers like P1 and P is slightly lesser and reaches its value, uh, lower point, lowest point at about six months. So, so when, it, when you're giving bisphosphonate therapy, then the resorption markers are the one which show a significant change that needs to be uh, observed. The, there has also been studies uh, where it has in a trial study where they have noted that uh, some of the, depending on the bisphosphonate use, there could be a variation on the bone separation. Alendronate and abendronate cause more separation of beta CTX center than resedronate. Not just that, when you're giving bisphosphonate therapy, you do not give it just for a few months. And you need to sometimes give the treatment for a very long time, like so many years, four years, three years, so on. So, in, there could still be a rare chance of a patient developing an vascular uh, uh, you know, fra fractures of the femur. And uh, so that being the thing, there, uh, that is the reason where uh, the concept of a drug holiday is there. And during the drug holiday, it sometimes you, you wonder when to start the treatment. So if you do during a drug uh, holiday also, an increase of the BTM levels by about 30%, if you're doing it a monitoring, it helps to guide the treatment for bisphosphonate to restart the therapy if required, so that you avoid fractures in these patients. The other resorption markers are, of course, uh, denosumab, which is a monoclonal antibody that targets the tank, uh, rank ligand, and it is a potent inhibitor of uh, bone resorption. This marker causes a rapid decrease of bone resorption within a few days of administration. And the serum uh, for bone formation markers like serum P1P and the bone alkaline phosphatase are also suppressed by denosumab. But this takes a little longer time as the same which we saw with bisphosphonate and takes up to three to six months to be completed. Uh, based on this, the IOF and the European uh, Calcified Tissue Working Group has recommended monitoring of oral bisphosphonate therapy, particularly the beta CTX1 and P1 at baseline level. And again, after three months, you start, get, check the baseline levels of these markers, start the treatment, and then you look for what are the changes which happen after three months. If as I said initially, I explained the concept of uh, significant change, which is about at least 30%. If there is a change of uh, at least around 30%, then you know that you are giving the right treatment and you can continue with the therapy. On the contrary, if suppose now there is not much of a change, you can literally say that you need to reassessment, assess the treatment and check whether there is compliance issues, whether the patient is actually taking the drug, are they taking with the uh, uh, you know milk, are they taking in the fasting or not, or if there is an improper way of giving injectables and so on. So that's why you need to reassess when you are doing the uh, bone uh, turnover markers. Coming to the anabolic agents like recombinant human parathyroid hormone, which is the other uh, method of treating osteoporosis, you see a very uh, cause, uh, it causes a very dose dependent and a rapid increase in the bone formation markers such as P1 NP and P1CP. But this response reaches peak levels about after three months. Usually it starts immediately within one month and it is being most responsive marker. Slowly, uh, uh, not exactly slowly, immediately after that, a small rise happens in the bone resorption markers follows it. Whereas when it comes to romosumab, which is binds to sclerostin, an osteocyte derived inhibitor of the osteoclastic acti activity and increases, which, uh, which causes increased bone formation, 
Here, what we see is that the bone formation marker, like P and V, it causes elite levels begin to increase within one week, reaches a peak at one month, and then slowly returns to pre-treatment value. So there is a transient rise uh, within a week, and then reaches a one month, and slowly comes back within uh, six months. Whereas the resorption markers, they show, slow, show a slow but a consistent decrease and remains below the baseline levels at 12 months. This was one of the studies which was done in NEGM, which very clearly, when you saw the treatment, uh, particularly when they were doing the study for Romosuber monthly, they gave a placebo as well as alendronate, terapeutide, uh, peritide, as well as uh, Romosuber. And it was noticed that if you look at this, this is the P1 and P, which is the bone formation marker. With when you give alendronate or bisphosphonate, there is a steady decline of the bone resorption markers. With the uh, teraperitide, there is a immediate quick increase. And if you look at the percentage also, it's so very high, the variation, which causes an increase in the um, bone turnover, particularly the P1NP. And the uh, as far as romosumab, there's a transient rise. And within shortly, then it starts declining over here. Whereas over here, when you look at it, when it's a uh, resorption markers, resorption markers, of course, come down with the uh, treatment with bisphosphonates, as well as there is a rise which is happening. As I said, there is a uh, rise which happens with uh, using the teraperitide, uh, teriperitide, and uh, the romosumab, of course, though there is a slow decline, but slowly continues, and up to 12 months, this decrease may be seen. What I would like to specify over here is basically that the changes in the bone turnover markers happen at the intervals about three to six months much early before the changes in the bone BMD, uh, uh, which is the commonly used investigation used in the treatment of osteoporosis. So that being the thing, for as an initial, when you're monitoring the patients, the response which is seen, what has been seen within six months of uh, with the, the markers or like lab markers, you have, you need nearly two years for that to be reflected in a BMD or a DEXA scan. What is the other advantage of using these markers is monitoring the, when you, when you're monitoring, you take a baseline value and share the data with the patients. It has definitely shown and you have a documented proof that how the graph is changing. It, it helps the patient in, uh, you know, adhering to the treatment and improves the compliance. The IF, of course, has, I've already mentioned, it has measured P1 and PSC before the start of therapy and after three months to identify patients with poor adherence. So that helps us okay. to understand whether the patient is taking treatment and also whether the uh, values, when we are compared to the premenopausal uh, values, they demonstrate evidence of increased bone lax and fracture, thereby convincing the patient to continue osteoporosis. Summarize over here where I the markers which are used are the bone formation markers like P1 and P osteocalcin, bone resorption markers are CTX, NTX, uh, uh, pyridol pyridolidin, and depyridolidin. But however, the two markers of choice are P1 and P CTX when it comes to monitoring of the patients. Patients on anti resorption therapy for look for the markers at three to six months intervals and for formation markers at six months and look for if there is a change in the values about 30%. If yes, then you can continue with the treatment. Otherwise you need to reassess the treatment and if required, move to the next drug. When it comes to the anabolic agents, it is better to look for the markers after one to three months because we see a quick rise over here and the resorption markers at three to six months. What I would just like to say is the bone term and, uh, turnover markers are definitely useful in monitoring patients on osteoporosis and reflects the therapeutic response to angioporosis much earlier than any uh, DEXA scan does. And baseline and repeated measurements of these markers improves adherence to treatment and assists in better management of the patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Renuka. You have not only detailed the various investigations, that uh, are required, but also you have talked about their relevance when you are monitoring the patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, stop sharing, please. All right. So, Dr. Amarnath. Yes. Dr. Amarnath, are you there? Then 
Dr. Srinivas. Yes, Amarnath, can I have the permission to make my presentation now? Shall I go ahead? Srinivas, shall I go ahead? Yes, sir, please. Right. So, what is the place of bisphosphonates, the non-biological anti-resorptive? And friends, as you can see, it is the first line before uh, denosumab or teriparatide come into play. Now, what are the absolute indications for bisphosphonates? Number one, postmenopausal osteoporosis and also primary osteoporosis where increase, there is increased risk of fracture, including recent low trauma hip fracture. Prevention of fragility fractures as well. And friends, we must be familiar with the two subtypes. Number one is type one which has a high turnover bone disease with high PTH and high alkaline phosphatase. And friends, for cost issues also, when the patient cannot afford biologics, it could be one of the options. Well, it can be considered in a sequential regimen and where it will have to be there. The relative indications are secondary osteoporosis, whatever is the cause, and IV jolendronate is famously known for its extensive use in a skeletal metastasis. The other indications are fibrous dysplasia, bone cyst, etc. Now, let us must know what are the contraindications where you should not use it. Well, pregnancy is one, hypocalcemia is another, and if some dental procedure is taking place or there has been a very recently a dental procedure has been gone through, do not use a bisphosphonate. All of us are aware that esophageal disorders, it should not be given. It is an irritant to esophagus. So even if there is a patient who cannot sit or stay upright for at least 30 minutes, do not use it. Also, do not use it in bariatric surgery or if there has been a previous adverse re reaction. Now, what are the other uh, absolute, I will say, contraindications? Number one, Dr. Tiwari is here. He will be talking about it. So, EGFR is less than 30 or 35. Please do not use it. And there is risk of over-suppressing the bone turnover due to drug accumulation in CKD. And before Dr. Marwa, uh, I must say, denosumab is here, very safe. Now, we must evaluate our patient prior to initiating bisphosphonates. So, one is already said, EGFR, renal function. Second, serum 25 hydroxyvitamin D3 must be optimized prior to initiating therapy. Vitamin D deficiency will precipitate hypocalcemia and bone pains. Serum calcium will also have to be looked into. And whenever you are looking into serum calcium, you must also look into serum albumin. Serum inorganic phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase, parathyroid status. Now, in a post-operative post patient, if you have to use it, the oral can be used safely after two weeks when the wound has healed. And IV should be used maybe a little earlier, but two weeks again is a better choice. Sustaining fracture while the patient is still on bisphosphonate, evaluate for adherence to therapy, assess the secondary causes, consider anabolic as an alternative therapy. Well, in cases of non-union, bisphosphonate and no bisphosphonate there has not been a very significant difference as far as union is concerned. Now, duration of therapy, all of us know, oral is five years is standard, IV is three years, but consider drug holiday for low risk patient, but maybe continued longer in high risk patient. I think I have written it wrong. It could be, yes, 
high risk patient for a higher risk of fracture, you can make your own assessment to continue with it. So, what is important? Optimization of calcium and vitamin D before you start the patient on bisphosphonate therapy. Now, what are the side effects and safety concerns? May cause esophageal irritation by its oral use and also in intravenous uh, can cause acute phase response, musculoskeletal pain, and all of us are aware about the dreaded two complications, osteonecrosis of the jaw, but the golden line is that osteonecrosis of the jaw invariably has been seen majority in patients who were on multiple dosing because of some, uh, some uh, cancer and atypical femur fractures are definitely there. Well, this there are side benefits of, also of uh, use of this phosphonate and we must know this. There is decreased risk of breast cancer, colorectal cancer, even decreased risk of a stroke is there. Gastric cancer also is reduced and the prognosis improves and it is an age, uh, you can say, age prolonging drug as well because it decreases overall mortality. Uh, it will increase overall mortality. Well, fracture efficacy of this phosphonate, all of us are aware the, with the dose, uh, but uh, we must know that ibandronate only works on spine and does not work so much on hip. And intravenous ibandronate is also available, but the 3 milligram dose is to be used every three months, but is not in common in practice because it works on a spine itself. So friends, this is in short about how we go about by, for using this phosphonate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now is the turn of our stalwart, Dr. Sunil Marwa, who talks about denosumab. Professor Marwa, I, I, I will stop share, please. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, management of uh, in osteoporosis of denosumab. Uh, quick bullet points. Uh, as far as orthopedic surgeons are concerned, I don't know why we are still at this level of management of osteoporosis. Because from last 10 years, the data and the everything has crystallized the studies so much. I think what we have to look at is making a scientific, simple explanation for the orthopedic surgeons. So it doesn't remain in this kind of situation, which I find lots of our colleagues are because of uh, lots of issues, which I think we have been trying to hash out in this thing. Coming to Dennis map. It is a rankle, is a physiological stimulator of osteoclastic maturation and bone resorption. That one molecule. Alteration of rankle osteoprotein ratio underlines the, the most postmenopausal osteoporosis changes. Denosumab is the fully human monoclonal antibody against rankle. So when it intercepts the rankle, the osteoporosis cannot go forward. So it is something which stops the osteoporosis from going forward just because it interjects the rankle, stops it from reaching where it can cause damage in the bone further. The benefit of this molecule is especially, it is so small and it is the only anti-resorptive that can reach inside the microcortical bone of the human body. So the all other antiresorptives go in the trabecular part, including zoldronic acid, but denosumab is the only one that reaches the cortical bone also. So with the result that the entire bone skeleton, the, the trabecular and the cortical part, both are taken care of, which is not possible by any other antiresorptive on the shelf. 
the treatment is for postmenopausal females and for men. The dose is 60 milligram every six monthly subcutaneous. And as of now, we say lifelong because we have a 23 year data sitting out there, which tells that we are still out there. So there is a huge, more than two decades of drug in hand and how it works, what it works is very, very certain. Lots of studies have been done in the last 20 years, huge number of studies. I have only picked up one or two which are very relevant in our bullet points. The, the first study that started was the freedom study in the first three years where placebo and the denosumab was used and it showed that there's consistent reduction of the vertebral fractures. This study was extended to 10 years. And it showed that even at 10 years, we are still reducing the vertebral fractures. The best part was that the hips showed a similar decline. So both the vertebral and the hips showed decline even at 10 years continuously. Next best point of this was that the DEXA bone density kept on improving year after year. And even at 10 years, it was still improving. Later on, we found out that when this denosumab is used continuously at five years, after five years, it starts becoming partly anabolic also. So not only it is anti-resorptive, working on both the cortical and the trabecular bone, but also at five years onwards, it is also becoming an anabolic, although to a very small extent, but it's giving us dual benefit. It was seen that 80% of the osteoporotic patients crossing a certain light become not fracture prone so much as they were to start with, with the FRAC score. So it reduces the, the fracture risk across the board, even in a severe or a mild case after a period of time. This sort of Tiwari will be coming on too. This is the only drug we have got which works and is given in renal osteoporosis for preventing bone loss and bone decay. We do not need to change any dose. We give the same dose, but there are some extra fine tuning to be done, which Dr. Tiwari will tell you, which is not easy, but he is the boss in this one and he will guide you on that one. But this is the only drug that can be used in renal osteoporosis and works like magic there also. So Prolia can be administered to patients with renal impairment without need for dose adjustment with other caveat with Dr. Tiwari will come to. Now, in the studies that have been carried on, one was against zoledronic acid. And we can see a sea change. They are not comparative. The bone density changes between a zoledronic acid and a Prolia patient, double blinded done, is three times because this molecule is working both at the cortical and trabecular side, while zoledronic acid is working only on the trabecular side. So the bone density improvements are so much. So why would we go to something which is not so good? I don't know. Coming to oral bisphosphonates. There is no comparison. Man, there is no comparison. The last time I used oral bisphosphonates was 2004. And it stands to truth today that when you have prolia in hand, why will you give an oral bisphosphonate with side effects, with very little benefit at two years while prolia is... This denosumab is starting to work with you within 48 hours time as the bone markers have shown. So we need to be on the scientific side. We need to give a correct message in this, in this program. 
we cannot be giving historical messages and keep our friends and colleagues confused what to use, when to use, low, medium, high. No, I think the time has come. Coming to the very specific bullet points. Long term, 10 years, continuous BMD increase and persistent fracture reduction. And this study is not new. This is an old study. And the current status in Switzerland is the first patient that they started on Denisumab was 23 years back and is still ongoing. So my friends, the track record is too long. No therapeutic plateau observed unlike bisphosphonates. You don't need to give okay, three years ke baad holiday period dena, paan saal ke baad holiday period dena, because you are expecting complications. There are no complications here. <laughs> no drug holiday recommended at all. You start it, but when you start it, you tell the patient it's lifelong because if you interrupt it, then you are giving trouble to the patient. He's back to square one. So that one point, when you start drugs like Dorosumab, you have to be very honest with the patient that this is something you are starting. And just like the blood pressure medicine, other, you have to protect your bone density with this lifelong. More every study, there are so many studies I could put down on the board and show you. More efficacious than all other bisphosphonates. There's no comparison in sustaining not only bone densities, but reducing the hip and spine fractures. There is no comparison, my friends and colleagues. Unique bone type uptake equally in cortical and trivicular bone leading to improved bone quality parameters. The only drug. The other bisphosphonates are not in the running at all. So why are we using them? Why are we projecting them? Why are we confusing our colleagues? Highest BMD outcomes till date with and after teraparatide. The data and data extension studies have shown so clearly what bisphosphonates and teraparatides do together and separately. My friends and colleagues, these studies are already more than 10, 15 years old and they have not changed. Why should we go to old unscientific data and project them while we have the newer, long, you know, these studies are done over years, over thousands of patients. These are not fly-by-night studies done over 10 patients and said 100 patients. No, they are not like that. The biggest part is no safety concerns. There are no stress fractures. There is no AVN. There's nothing happens. Even at 10 years, so it's a, I mean, it's a wonder drug. The only anti-resorptive that the drug is used for patients in renal insufficiency. So thank God we have a drug which can even work in renal insufficiency, but with lots of caveats, which Dr. Tiwari will be telling us. It offers long-term compliance advantage. It has been shown compliance studies have been done under against alendronate, against zoledronic acid, against so many other drugs. And it has shown those studies are in not for one day, two day, five years studies have shown how the patients drop out of the oral uh, and the and the IV dosage and have not or the least amount have dropped out of the subcutaneous injection every six monthly. So, I mean, we have to give very clear message to our colleagues. If we keep them confused, we will be where we were. So the educated regime for denosumab is very clear in the males and females. For us, when the FRAC score starts showing fracture risk, start PTH followed by denosumab lifelong. And if while you are building the bone with PTH, you have a fracture, add the denosumab right away. This has not changed. And these studies were done a decade back and they have not changed, my friends. The... Second point here, because in our settings, we get the patient at fragility stage. So if you have a fragility fracture patient, start as the data and data extension studies are shown, start with PTH and denosumab right away, same day. Also, because 
90% of our patients have come to us or are coming to us with some kind of an anti-resorptive patient before. So when we are in trouble and we are coming in with the anabolic, start with the combination because as the biomarkers have shown that in the first six months, there's going to be drop when you come in with PTH, you're going to be asking for more trouble. So if you come in with combination, you are reducing that drop. But the message is very clear, my friends and colleagues. Build the microagriculture first with PTH and then protect it with denosumab lifelong. For emergency and transit treatment, combination treatment is the way forward. If we give scientifically correct, simple messages in our workup towards our orthopedic community, I think the confusion will be removed and the doctors will know how to use, when to use, which is first drug, which is second drug, how long to use and how safe they are to use. And they will not be keeping worrying that this can happen, that can happen, how much benefit, not benefit, and whether we need to do a biomarkers or not done. We reduce the cost by taking away all these uh, things and we give a definite message on how to protect our patient and improve. But we have to be very scientifically correct and not be wishy-washy. We cannot be politically correct and wrong scientifically. We have to be scientifically correct and politically incorrect, maybe if required. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marwa. You always keep on doing great justice to the topic of denosumab, and we really respect. But as I, I have been discussing this evening, that we are going to frame guidelines for our Indian population. And number one, insurance is not covered for all the population. So patients themselves will have to bear the cost. And even if otherwise you feel it is very safe, more than 20 years study is there, can, there, can we reach a point where we have to think that we can now stop the treatment? or it will be, as you have said, a lifelong affair. If you want me to speak uh, 30 seconds on that, the very uh, long, uh, sorry. Right, please. please the please. very long-term studies, patients who have been two decades on this treatment, in the very recent past, they have come out with three regimes. One regime is Continue with denosumab. Second regime is no, stop it. Give teraparatide for a period of time and then give denosumab. The third regime they have said is zolodonic acid, three doses in a year if it is patient can take it safely. So they are now experimenting in, in patients who have been on 20 years, 25 years of osteoporosis. These drugs, that what is the way forward? I hope in next half a decade, we may get some answers from there. But till then, this is the scientific way forward. Right. There we are, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Tiwari, he is talking on yes, sir. Ren renal osteoporosis. Professor Tiwari. Yeah, good evening, sir. Restrict yourself to it. 10 minutes. Right. Yes, sir. Right. We are talking about the renal osteoporosis. Okay. One minute is slide. Your Dr. presentation Tiwari, is visible. Slide yes. is not one minute, sir. No. Dr. Tiwari, I you can... You can yes, sir. No. Bring the cursor on the presentation and click it and click again. It'll work. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. Right. Yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah. So much problem. No, I, as we know that osteoporosis is common in chronic disease. And this depends on the stages of the chronic kidney disease, the management of osteoporosis. And this stages depends on the GROM EGFR. Stage one is 
CFR more than 90 ml per minute per 1.73 meters per body surface area. And stage 5 is less than 15 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square body surface area or patient on dialysis. That is the end stage renal disease. And depending on the stage, management of osteoporosis differs. This early stage is stage 1 to 3B. It is recommended to diagnose based on the DMD. Bone miller density, the T score 2.5 standard deviation or more below the young adult mean BMD or presence of fragility fracture. And the late stage, stage 4 5, diagnosis only by excluding the chronic disease mineral bone disease with laboratory test and sometimes bone biopsy. What are laboratory tests? In the stage 3, in early stage, with history of fragility fracture and our low BMD, the T score less than 2.5. Investigation, you have to do the serum calcium, inorganic in phosphorus, PTH, 25 hydroxybutamine D, and alkaline phosphatase. But in the late stage, stage 4 and 5, bone specific alkaline phosphatase may be evaluated in addition to the above investigation. Assuming there is no coexistence of renal osteodystrophy. Role of bone biopsy, it may be considered if a specific diagnosis of bone disease has significant management implication. The assessment of fracture is in early stage, the bone mineral density by DEXA usually done, but in the late stage of stage four and five, DEXA only in selected patients who have fragility fracture and no evidence of CKD with bone, mineral bone disorder. Management, as we know that the lifestyle measures like regular weight wearing and muscle strengthening exercise, fall preventive measures and cessation of tobacco use. Use of the calcium and vitamin supplementation in early stage, stage one to three B, the target calcium index would be 1000 mg calcium and 600 mg of international unit of vitamin D daily. In late stage, this is 4 5, target calcium index would be 1200 mg per day and vitamin D3, that is calcitriol, by 25 to 2 microgram per day. Treatment of hypogonadism is important for the effective treatment of osteoporosis in pre-menopausal women with chronic kidney disease, with low bone mass and our fragility fracture, low dose oral contraceptives, if not contraindicated, or estradiol or progestin replacement therapy is required. In men with chronic kidney disease, osteoporosis and symptomatic hypogonadism, estrogen therapy is recommended if not contraindicated. The pharmacology therapy, if you see that early stage is stage 1 to 3B and no evidence of CKD, MBD, choice of pharmacology is similar as of patient without chronic kidney disease, like anti disease therapy, abidronate, zolidronic acid, residronate, and denisumab, if patient can afford, can be used in this stage. Teraparatide, that Dr. Marwa has told, you have to start early with the 20 micrograms subcutaneously daily, only if ETH is low or normal, especially in A dynamic bone disease. Reloxifen, 60 milligram daily in post menopausal women, it is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. The second group is stage 4 5. With evidence of chronic kidney disease, mineral bone disease, without fragility fracture. If patient have the CKD MBD, that's all. Alone should not be used for the fracture risk assessment. It is not recommended to treat with pharmacology therapy. If patient has CKD MBD, we have to treat the CKD M MBD first in these patients. If patient in the late stage or CKD with or without evidence of CKD MBD with fragility fracture from pharmacological therapy to be considered. 
And the main drug in the latest stage, we have now what Dr. Barwa told is Genisumab. 60 milligram subcutaneously every six months, both in early and late CKD. It is neither affect kidney function nor metabolized by the kidney. But only thing that if patient is on dialysis, hypercalcemia is the problem and we should watch the hypocalcemia and treat accordingly. Ramosuba, 210 milligrams of ketosine once in a month for 12 months. What we are discussing about is the patient after the transplant. Patient in first 12 months after kidney transplant, if EGFR is more than 30 ml per minute with low bone mineral density, vitamin D and alpha calcidol and calcitol, depending on the GFR and NP reductive therapy, what we have discussed regarding the GFR, we have to use. In later stage, TKD stage 4 and 5, and low bone mineral density managed as for the patient with the chronic disease, stage 4, 5, Denisubab, what we have discussed now. It is reasonable to consider bone biopsy to guide the treatment. What we are discussing in Osteoporosis is mainly common in the early stage, stage 1, 2, 3. But in stage 4, 5, late stage, usually associated with the CKD, MBD, mineral bone density. And mineral bone density have the problem with hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, metabolic acidosis, and hyperparathyroidism. And that should be treated. Hypocalcemia should be treated with the dietary calcium top 800 to 1000 milligram per day. If patient has acute hypocalcemia, we treat with the intravenous calcium. Tonic hypocalcemia should be treated with the oral calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Vitamin D may need to be added if oral calcium administration alone does not correct the hypocalcemia. And you can use the calcitriol 0.25 to 2 microgram per day depending on the severity of the disease. If patient on dialysis, we have to increase the Dialysis with calcium concentration between 1.25 to 1.5 millimole per liter. Hyperphosphatemia is the major problem in these patients, and that should be treated. Dietary phosphorus index should be restricted to maximum 2,000 milligram per day. But whatever the cereals you are using, the fruits you are using, that contains major phosphorus. That should be restricted. If not controlled with the restriction of the phosphorus, we have to use the phosphate binders. In adult patient with the stage 3 and 5D, restrict the dose of the calcium-based phosphate binders. In children, it is reasonable to base the choice of the phosphate binders treatment depending on the serum calcium level. Cellular carbonate is the main drug now used everywhere for the phosphate as a phosphate binder. And dose of the phosphate binder similar much depending on the serum phosphorus level. If more than 5.5, less than 7.5, the 800 milligram size daily, between 7.5 to 9 milligram of the phosphorus, 1200 milligram size daily. If more than 9 milligram percent, 1600 milligram size daily as a phosphate binder. Another newer phosphate binder available, we are using that sucrophilic hydroxy hydroxide, oxyhydroxide. And that is the, not only binds with the phosphorus, but also acts as iron and increases the hemoglobin level. And it uses the adult patient on dialysis, 500 ml size daily. If calcium containing phosphate binders, syndrome cannot be used. Metabolic acidosis is very important problem in these patients. Should be treated with simple drugs, oral sodium bicarbonate, tablet one to two grams twice or thrice daily recommended and Veviramor is a promising new drug in the treatment of metabolic acidosis. The major problem to treat in these patients are secondary hyperparathyroidism. What you develop due to the hypoglycemia, it stimulates the parathyroid and causes secondary hyperparathyroidism. As we know, the treatment is active vitamin D in stage 4 and 5. The parathyroid hormone elevation persists despite dietary phosphate restriction, phosphate binders, and nutritional vitamin D treatment. Lysetal 0.25 to 2 microgram per day. In patients develop hypercalcemia, 
you can use the sinapelin that is calcium imatis in stage 5 with persistent hyperparathyroidism despite active vitamin D treatment or when hyperphosphatemia or hypercalcemia limits the application of vitamin D treatment, we use the sidacalate 30 mg per day initially and titrate every 2 to 4 weekly internal till the dose of 180 mg per day maximum. But still, if not control the secondary hyperparathyroidism, and patient develop the arthritis fibrosa cystica, severe bone disease, pyrothyroidism is indicated in these patients. These are the indications, clinical severe pruritis. Pruritis is such a problem in these patients, it required the pyrothyroidectomy. Fractures, accelerated vascular calcifications, peripheral calcifying uremic arteriolopathy, Unexplained cardiomyopathy and heart failure, and if parathyroid gland dimension is more than 500 millimeter per cube. Biochemical condition leading to parathyroidectomy, persistent serum PTH level more than 800 picogram per ml for more than six months, uncontrolled hypercalcemia or hyperphosphatemia, high level of bone markers like bone especially alkaline fungi that it. Trap 5D are less than 30% reduction in the serum PTS level following aggressive intravenous or oral vitamin D treatment for 12 weeks in symptomatic patient. And if less than 30% reduction of the PTS to 12 weeks of treatment with maximum dose of calcium mimetics, 180 mg per day in symptomatic patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much. Professor Tiwari, <clears throat> please stop sharing. Right. Uh, Dr. Amarnath, Dr. Amarnath, you are there. Sir, good evening, sir. Yes, I am very much there, sir. Thank you. Oh, what comes here? No, sorry. Shall I share? Oh, sure. Only yeah, bullet, bu bullet points, yes. 100%, sir, 100%. Thank you, thank you, and this is me. And a couple of hospitals where I work, it's very important for me so that it's documented. And this is two organizations where I'm directly uh, having responsibility. And thanks to the IOA, the parent organization, we are here and actively participating in all the academics. With this, yes, Dr. Ja, yes, bullet point. I'm going to give you, and I promise you, you're going to have a lot of bullet points. Next. Now, none of us want any fracture. Now, we don't want a hip fracture, to tell you frankly. That is the biggest challenge. All this is done not just for a fracture, as Dr. Ja earlier mentioned, the entire skeleton, musculoskeleton, we are addressing. But today's focus is on osteoporosis and the bullet point. Hence, we talk about it. And today's my commitment is on calcium and vitamin D. Your net connectivity has become weak. Most discussed, yet most confused, and yet. <clears throat> you are not audible.
Amarnath, you are not audible. You are muted. Amarnath, you are muted. Can you hear me, sir, now? No, yeah. Wonderful. I'm, I'm extremely sorry. I'm extremely sorry. Now, I can see there are a lot of challenges that we talk about. Hence, I'm going to run to the next slide. And here, every homo sapien has 1.5 kilograms of calcium when once you have the bone ash. That is the amount that we have here. So it's a very, very important you know, mineral for us. How do we go about it? Many salts, many, many salts, from carbonate to citrate, whatnot. And then I'm just naming a few here. The list is even bigger than this. Now, calcium, our nature is so good. God is so good. Our creation of body is so good. Every human being's calcium is maintained in the serum at the optimum level by taking calcium and making sure that this blood has the highest level possible to maintain from head to toe, even to blink your eyes or even to beat your heart. Without calcium ion, no transmission doesn't matter. Heart doesn't beat. Liver doesn't function. As Dr. Tiwari said, kidney doesn't function. So very, very important. Few pointers. I'll run this busy slide. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Carbonate has a bigger elemental content and comes the next calcium citrate malleate. So with that, these two are very well I mean, you know, accepted. And in the past, we used to talk about hypocalcemic titanium. Thankfully, we don't see it much, but we are seeing by and large in a big way. At that time, we need to probably about injectables uh, to make sure that infection happens there. But again, we have to be very carefully monitoring the cardiac functions when we're injecting. Do not inject immediately. You need to give it extremely slow and monitor them. So that is one point I wanted to address with the injectable here. Otherwise, mainly overall we don't. Now, calcium, we need to understand. It's very funny that uh, we are all dealing with, obviously, very good uh, pharmaceutical companies, but a lot of countries. Elemental calcium, ionic calcium, what is the content? How much is it absorbed? All of those issues are coming in. So this is the biggest, biggest challenge we talk about. And we also talk about who is monitoring. This has been monitored by DCGI and also by FSSAI. What do I mean by that? DCGI, we know the pharmaceutical companies, preparations are coming under directly under the drug controller. And calcium being a food supplement, it is also sold under FSSAI. What is that? Safety Standard Association of India. So they both have been given the rights. So you need to be careful and clear. As a clinician, you and I need to understand what is the RDA, Recommended Daily Alliance of Calcium. Now, we talk about that. Probably we require many than what we talk about. We need to do this. Blackness. Initially or later or monitoring, a lot of things have been misconceptualized. Hence, I briefly talk about this. Monitoring sugar levels are very essential for us for diabetes. I not cancer? People say, yes, not it. But when there is a challenge, when you're giving either bisphosphonates or even denisumab, or even when you're giving teriparatide, it could be hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia. A lot of challenges happen there. They all come with a big baggage of diabetes, hypertension, whatnot, CKD, and huge amount of cardiac challenges. Hence, it is essential for us to make sure that we work as a team as physicians so that we do not get pointed at when a patient is on a very severe calcium 
inhibitor and we go on pumping it. And then when there is a challenge of hypercalcemia, we should not be pumping. People say, oh, calcium will be you know, gone in the stools and feces. No, there are challenges. We need to be clear and clarify on those issues. So hence, monitoring is important. Dosage. Well, babies are, as per the WHO, the dosage is a little different. As for the FSSAI and DCCI, the dosage is a little different in India. So, because it is not just the tablets they're going to give you, you also have your dietary calcium coming in. So, hence, monitor that. How do we do it? Ideally, calcium can be given and should be given in divided doses because Indian diet contains a lot of other challenges. And one of the most important here is the phytate. The phytate causes a lot of challenge for absorption. And many of us coming to the senior citizen group, by the time middle age and there, we have what is called as an IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And I don't want to get into all those challenges there, but yes, even with the highest elemental, whatever possible, there will be lowest possible absorption. Hence, we need to divide doses. That would be great. And in men, we need to give it a little higher. So up to 1,500 or even 20 is acceptable. In women, 1,000 to 1,500 mg per day is good enough. I would recommend divided dose. Next, calcium is not just a calcium. Calcium is a hormone which regulates vitamin D and parathyroid. All three are interrelated. All three play at each other and synergistically work to make sure we have an equilibrium of all these things happening. Taking a couple of points, Dr. Tiwari did come across. One biggest challenge we talked about, am I going to get renal stone, kidney stone for taking calcium? There are interruptions. And eventually, due to environmental have we get that into a big. of calcification has. Vitamin D comes under a fat-soluble vitamin, like A, E, and K together. And it is not just a vitamin. It is a cholesterol. It is a sterol. It is a hormone. It is a PTH and a calcium regulator. And one of the most, most important micronutrient in and daily requirement is extremely important. Most of us are deficient. A lot of studies have been done, and I've been part of SBMR. We have done a lot of studies there, and I am not getting to the challenge there. And yes, we require. There are many sorts of vitamin D, vitamin D2, D3, and calcitriol. Dr. Tiwari has given a very clear cut understanding on calcitriol. Lots of confusion. Calcitriol, please reserve it for renal patients. Don't use it on a daily basis. I've seen patients coming with huge amount of calcitriol usage and having multiple problems. So how do we go about addressing it? When we talk about blood vitamin D level, there is a lot of confusion there. One laboratory gives you nanogram and other laboratory gives you nanomore later. Which one is what? You need to be very clear, playful when you're re reading it. I'll talk about nanogram. Now, anything below 30 nanogram is osteomalacia. But here, the interpretation goes adequate, inadequate, efficient, all those confusion terms. Just keep that osteomalacia. Anything below 30 nanogram, you need to address it. Yes, people are not at 30. They're all at 10, 15, 5, 6. Some of them are not even recordable. So that is the biggest thing. And I maintain, and with the research, we have seen optimum level to be maintained at around 60 to 80 nanogram. 100 above, so naturally we don't want to be given there. So keep that in mind. And this is the biggest, biggest questionable, debatable, and go on. 1,000 to 2,000 international units per day recommendation. But 
in osteomalacia, in osteoporosis, you need to clearly treat osteomalacia first before giving any of those analog, no, anabolic or even uh, bisphosphonates or intensum. Extremely important point. Correct osteomalacia first. And then do this. It could be oral, it could be injectable. Hence, they talk about correctional dose. They talk about loading dose because many of us, 95% of the population, if not 90, are osteomalacia. Hence, loading dose comes into a big picture. Injectables, we reserve it. We do not want to have nephrotoxicity in a big way. Hence, if the patient is able to take orally, give them weekly dose. How long? How much? 60,000 international units per week, at least for 12 weeks, and then maintain it once in, uh, bi monthly for another few months or monthly every month. Tell you frankly, one, I'm on cal calcium and vitamin D for the last 40 years. I take vitamin D bi monthly. During COVID time, I've taken every week, two and a half years, 30 months, my family has taken. Every every week, sixty thousand. I haven't seen, to tell you frankly, toxicity happen. Now, anything below five nanogram, please, please make sure the poly pharmacy is addressed with, and you can give an injectable three hundred thousand to six hundred thousand, three lakh to six lakh units per patient, and then switch to oral. Now, there are many formulations available. You choose what is best available. Please tell them to take it with if they have lactic, lactic acid intolerance, they can mix with the food and take it. Big food is a good idea. People say fasting doesn't matter. Ideally, take it with fat food because most of our Indian diet has fat in a diet. So I tell them along with your food, you take it. So it makes it very simple and very easy. You choose how you want to go about it. This is to be addressed right from childhood to Till the one foot in the grave kind of thing, you know. So you need to give this on a regular basis. Thankfully, the new formulations, we are I'm in touch with a couple of uh, companies now, uh, our trade partners. We are coming out with very, very interesting, uh, you know, uh, formulations. It's going to change the dynamics in vitamin D. With this, I would say, look, we have given a lot of importance to heart. Look, we require it. But what does the heart do? Heart is pumping the blood for us to have the essential nutrient all through the body. But the blood has to be good. You need to have the good blood. Where is it coming from? Skeleton. Dr. Jha told us about that in the beginning. You need to look after the foundation better because blood is produced in your bone marrow. If your bone marrow is weak, if your bone is weak, what is it going to produce? Look at zilch, water, sebum. It has no value. Look after your skeleton. Your house stays better. You stay better. And with that, I thank you for giving me this time. Hope this was clear some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramarnath. You had the last nail in the coffin of osteoporosis and so it will continue to remain very important. Now all the topics are open for discussion. There was a presentation on teriparatide. I, I skip this. Only uh, I find Dr. Ravi you are there. Dr. Ravi? No? Dr. Ravi Sauta? Left. Okay. Dr. Marwa? Uh, Ravi Sauta looks like he is left. I'm okay. there, sir. Yes, ah, sir. Yes, yes. You oh, must Ravi is there. So for you, I have kept this one. So how do we really sequence? So suppose uh, how you go about it. Uh, so, sir, as far as the sequencing right. is concerned, uh, right. You can hear me, sir? Ha, very clearly.
you were audible ravi you are muted now can you unmute yourself please ravi you are muted dr ravi okay. can you can you can yes 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 can you hear me sir right yes again un uh, again muted okay okay ah. sorry uh so uh, so depending upon if the patient uh, is uh, already on uh, uh, has taken two years of uh, teriparatide they can be put on denosumab or zolidronic acid as uh, desired so once you start uh, giving them uh, zolidronic acid Uh, this is uh, as you rightly said that it is for three years and then drug holiday may be required. Denosumab can be given lifelong without stoppage, without any side effects. That is one sequence. Other is uh, so, so, that yes, there are multiple sequences. Now coming to between teriparatide and denosumab, how how do you switch over? Which one first? Which one later? so uh, when you are uh, generally uh, those patients who are uh, treatment naive uh, where you are planning to give them denosumab uh, those patients uh, when there is no uh, fragility fracture which is happening or they can be continued on denosumab but those patients who are on any lower type of uh, 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 bisphosphonates like for example they are on oral or any other bisphosphonates and they have a fragility fracture now these patients at some point of a time needs to be shifted to teriparatide and then sequenced with the denosumab right thank you um, professor marwa between yeah. these two uh, how do you prefer to sequence if it, at all there is chance the, that we should sequence the scientific criteria laid down is if your gram per square centimeter bone in the trabecule is 1 gram and above then you are very safe in protecting that bone just with denosumab we don't need any teraparatide if the t score is all right and which should right. be all right if you have got the gram per square centimeter all right but if your t score has dropped because the gram per square centimeter had dropped earlier then you need to build your trabecule with the pth because if you do not build your trabecule with the pth then where are you going to keep this calcium out there there's no place so it is very clear cut if your t's are low then you need to build up the bone with pth yes and then continue with denosumab but if while you are building up your bone with pth the patient has a fracture fragility you come in with denosumab immediately to potentiate the benefit of pth and yeah. as dr ravi was saying if you are transiting from an anti resorptive to an anabolic there will be further drop in the bone strength so in that cases it is recommended strongly that you start with a combination treatment combination combination treatment both put together same day same time to reduce the trough which otherwise 6 months will take you into more troubles that's the scientific end of the sequencing treatment right dr so, cha if i may ask a question yes please please uh, so there are two things i need to ask question one is to dr renuka and also to uh, dr marwa uh, both of them are the, the question is the same what about the cost benefit analysis in our situation with denosumab teriparatide as well as uh, you know bone turnover markers you know the cost side out of it it becomes a major factor so how do you propose we structure it into the guidelines 
Dr. Marwa, please. Uh, see, we are proposing to lay down scientific guidelines for our friends. Mm -hmm. In scientific guidelines, we have to be very correct. What are we telling them in last 15, 20 years of information base? You may have a patient who can't afford calcium, who can afford anything. So that is secondary. First, you have to give the correct guidelines to for the patient, uh, for the doctors, that this is the scientific guideline advisable. And then the doctor can decide which patient, what can he afford? So that comes secondary. But if you give him a confused guidelines, you are nowhere. And anybody, see, uh, tomorrow I'm standing in a court of law and somebody comes in with a fragility fracture and he has been given oral uh, anti-resorptive or other things. And if I'm asked a question, I'll tell, no, this is wrong, wrong treatment he has been given. And tomorrow, this is going to be uh, the legal part, part is as important as the, the treatment part. So the correct guidelines have to be given. And then, of course, the, 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 the patient's pocket is different. It can be from zero to 100. So th that depends on that. But the I see it in a slightly different way, sir. I see it in a slightly different way. I agree 100% with you. But what I feel is that if... Uh, if you look at the National AIDS Control Program, National Tuberculosis Control Program, expensive drugs are being provided by the state. So if we put across guidelines for DEXA and for drugs such as Dedosumab and the use of uh, biological markers as a necessity, will it stimulate the authorities to make these available for this modern pandemic? I call it a modern pandemic, nothing less than that. So I think that that's another way of looking at it. But I do agree with you. Dr. Amarnath is got a point. Yes, Dr. Amarnath, please. Thank you, Dr. Jha. Uh, Murli, thank you. See, now, this is the point I was literally coming to. When once we have this, today we have uh, Janaushada. Every corner of the village, literally, at that level, grassroots level, Janaushada has started, generic medicine. Today, we talk about the originator molecule and the biosimilar molecule. So, there are going to be challenges. Generic are going to be the future as well, but something is better than nothing at all. That is one thing. So, guideline gives us a clear-cut understanding. Dr. Marva clearly said on the, you know, we are today, we are all practicing not just medicine, we are into legal medicine. That is the biggest issue as well. We have to address it because the next generation has to take the clear-cut guideline, which is formed now, and it's going to evolve as we move along. Guideline is not going to be stringently rigid. So let us have this guideline, which has come in, and going to give you the evidence base and take it forward, and we will have our own database coming in, and then we evolve on that. Second point, affordability. One, I told generic. Second, the insurance segment. There are few insurance, more than six insurance companies in the private who are giving the post-discharge treatment for four months to eight months. Imagine eight months of therapy is given free of cost to them. <laughs> and 60 days before admission, that is covered. Or 10 months of treatment is covered in by and large, majority of the private companies, government companies like uh, National, United, New India, and the Oriental have not done that because of the GIPSA packages. We are coming out heavily on them as well. In the near future, we will change that. Uh, we will see the state of change happening even in the insurance segment. So that will be one of the things which I wanted to add. Hope it uh, so gives a clarity. We have to, to impress upon the government also that these costly medicines yes. should be made available. Those persons who are retired yeah. from central government or state government, CGHS or state uh, HS, should ma make these drugs available. But still, we will have to have 
guidelines in which the basic drugs also can be used. Correct. In, in Indian context, that is why no. Indian Orthopedic Association has thought of it. Uh, yeah, we would like to conclude now. Uh, Sarat, are you there? Yeah, Dr. Srinivas, any comments? Yes, on your end? Srinivas. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Sarat had a question that should we go for uh, BMD evaluation, that means DEXA scan evaluation, or should we prefer these uh, bone turnover markers? Uh, I think you would like to reply this. Is that to me, sir? Uh, yeah, you can also reply. So the, the uh, which the... one is to be preferred, bone turnover I... markers or the, the yes, well, the exercise scan. According to WHO, the gold standard to diagnose osteoporosis is a DEXA scan, sir. So I would prefer a DEXA scan over bone turnover markers. Bone turnover markers are not to be used for diagnosis, but they can be used for monitoring. Right. Uh, yeah, when this, I think this is very important. Or this needs to be incorporated in the no. guidelines. No, no, no. But there is a but. Uh, your, your voice got interrupted. So just... Uh, I want to emphasize that changes in the DEXA scan does not come earlier than two years. It may be there depending upon what drug are you using that at the end of one year, patient may be symptomatically much better, but uh, it will not reflect so much in the uh, BMD DEXA scan. That is the reason... Dexa. If you have, you have to monitor your patient, you should preferably go for BTM, bone turnover markers, but then cost again is one issue. Uh, Dr. Marwa, would you like to say something? Bone turnover markers are used worldwide still only on the research purposes and on very difficult patients when you are having a problem, which are very few. So to generalize use of bone markers for a normal osteoporotic patients, I think we will be not only wasting resources, also the issue is that these are highly unstable. And if you haven't done two before when you start the treatment, you are doing afterwards, your information may be totally uh, wonky. So bone turnover markers are still, that's why selectively used only in research patients, research people, where it's a controlled environment that before starting the drug, you are doing it and they are highly unstable and not easy to do. So there are so many things we have not yet in the frame of uh, clear bone marker used for the general public and for the general orthopedic association. No, I'm not in favor of it at all. Right. And uh, have I ever used it? No, never. But because, we have to be uh, simultaneously uh, be aware, Professor Marwa, G. that it will not reflect in one year so much. It will be only at the end of two years that tenosumab or teriparatide will reflect it there. Yeah, I agree with you, sir. Right. Dexa bone density, uh, once I start the patient on treatment, I don't repeat it. Right. Because if you repeat it after six months to one year or even two years, right. the patient will be at your neck that I'm sitting where I am and I've spent so much money. If yes. the patient has not broken the bone, that is the proof that he is fine. Right. Dr. Chinma is there. Dr. Chinma, uh, any, any point that you wish to raise? Yes, or sir, you good like evening, to... sir. Good uh, evening, right. sir. I oh, couldn't okay. be uh, means because of some network issues. I couldn't come uh, oh, okay. on the does, video. Does not but I'm listening, and uh, that's a good discussion, sir. We had uh, regarding the, the guidelines, the bullet points for guidelines of osteoporosis, that is by IOA, and uh, we had a good attention, uh, good uh, attendance too, as well as uh, a good discussion, and uh, regarding. Uh, 
the, uh, uh, the regarding the point uh, professor marwal sir has uh, raised that we should use uh, go for denosumab and pth uh, in a sequential therapy i think that's a good uh, scientific point and we should take note of it but uh, in our context as you have rightly said sir in indian context we should start with bisphosphonate can we have some balance in the guidelines between these two statements sir yes uh, there there will be some space definitely uh, because we are trying to develop the guidelines in Indian context. So that will be one. Uh, uh, Dr. Sarat, now we have crossed the time limit. So uh, yes, on, your, on your part, you have a very great task of saying thanksgiving. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, it has been a pleasure for me to be a part of this uh, webinar. I thank the esteemed speakers for giving the bullet-like insight into this very important and clinically relevant topic of osteoporosis. I thank Professor S.S. Jha, who has always been a source of encouragement uh, due to his dynamism and as a towering pillar for initiating such webinars. At last, I thank IOA TV and uh, Ortho TV team for giving platform for hosting this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, we are dispersing for a meeting, sir. Uh, meeting on Sunday and Sunday will be uh, the time will be informed by Dr. Uh, Amarnath. So it is Sunday forenoon. Good night, you. everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Oh, 10 o'clock in the morning. Ah, okay. You're going to have the meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning. So, okay. no worries. Right. Okay. It'll be much before that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Murli. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.